Ryan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. We've been working our way through the various sources for our Greek New Testament. We've looked at the papyri and the unseals, but there's so much more to consider. I wish I had time to really delve into each of these various categories in much more detail, but alas, this is just an overview on our way to getting into the topic of Bible translation. In fact, the New Testament papyri and unseals combined make up less than 2% of our manuscripts. Today, we'll consider the other 90% of manuscripts, including minuscules, lectionaries, quotations in the Church Fathers, and ancient translations. Here now is episode 337, Part 8 of our Bible class, Other New Testament Manuscripts. We've been looking at the sources for the New Testament in our quest to understand how we got the Bible. Last time we looked at the unseals. Before that, the papyri. Today, we have some more sources to consider. Today, we're going to look at the minuscules, the lectionaries, and the church fathers, and ancient translations. (laughs) So... I had to slip in one last category there for you. So these are our four topics for today we're going to be covering in New Testament sources. So much of ancient writing is determined by economics, just simply determined by the fact that everything is so expensive. So when minuscule script came out in the 9th century, it basically just took over everything because you could fit more words on a page. As the codex was to the scroll, so minuscule was to majuscule, or unseal as I was calling it before. And this brought about a revolution in books because you could fit smaller letters and more letters per page because they're using this smaller size font, not quite as close to what we would call cursive today, uh, but getting in that direction a little bit. And so you could have the same book, but have it be shorter, which would be saving on money for uh, parchment and ink, or you could fit more books into the same amount of space and even make them portable, which is something we start seeing in the Middle Ages. You can also write faster. I mean, test yourself. If you want to take a chapter of the Bible and just write it in all capital letters with no spaces between them, see how that goes, and then write the same thing in lowercase cursive and see which one is, first of all, faster, and second of all, fits more letters. It's going to be the minuscule. So this change happened in the 9th century. So for New Testament manuscripts, most of our later manuscripts are in minuscule letters as opposed to the uh, earlier unseals. And... As it turns out, we have about 10 times as many minuscules as we have majuscules. So let's talk numbers. Here we have, in the first grouping, 130 plus papyri. We've already looked at those. For example, P45. And you can see the way that we write that, if you recall from our previous session, is in this Gothic font, this letter P. And then we have a superscript for the number 45. And of course, that manuscript also has its own name. Uh, It's called P. Chester BD1. That's the other name for P45. Then we have 320 plus unseals, and those are just labeled by a number, always starting with zero. Then the more famous ones have a letter associated with them, but if there's 320 plus unseals, guess what? There's only 26 letters in the English alphabet. And even if you exhaust the Greek alphabet after that, you're still not even coming close. So the number is really the more closer guarantee of what we're talking about. And then it has its own name, Codex Vaticanus. Then, after these two, we have nearly 3,000 minuscules. So it just dwarfs in comparison everything that came before it. 130 papyri, 320 unseals, 3,000 minuscules. And then after that, we have 2,500 lectionaries. And then we have dozens of church fathers that we can quote from. And you can see when you refer to a minuscule, what you do is you just cite the number. For the unseals, you have the zero out front, and then for the lectionaries, you have this cursive L, and that tells you that it's a lectionary. So this is all going to come into focus later when we look at critical versions of the Greek New Testament, where they have the apparatus at the bottom, and they're trying to tell you important information about which manuscripts contain these verses, which ones don't. So this is all going to come back around later, so that's why I'm bringing it up now. And then as far as citing a church father, 
Uh, usually you just put the name of the church father, the name of the book, and then the reference in the book. So the book one, chapter four, paragraph five. All right, so let's look at some minuscules. Here is Codex 39, also called the Queen of the Cursives. Strictly speaking, once again, minuscules are not cursives, but it is a style of writing similar to cursive. This comes to us from the early 9th century, and it has the entire New Testament except Revelation. I mean, look at the penmanship of this scribe, the incredible straight lines that we can see. And then on the left here, I have it zoomed in. This almost looks like just a printed page. Really, really staggering. Here's a picture of Codex 565, sometimes called the most beautiful of the minuscule manuscripts. Purple vellum. And then they used for ink gold, golden ink. Another one to mention is Codex 16. I don't happen to have a picture of it, uh, but what's interesting about this manuscript, Codex 16, is that it comes to us from the 14th century, but it's the first Bible, at least that I know, I'm aware of, that is color-coded. So you know like some Bibles in our time will have the words of Jesus in red? Uh, Codex 16 does something interesting. It has like an orangish red for narrative, and then they use crimson for the words of Jesus, the genealogies, the words of angels. Then they use blue ink for quotations from the Old Testament, or if one of the disciples is talking, or Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, Simeon, or John the Baptist. And then they use black ink for the Pharisees, the centurion, Judas, the devil, and the shepherds. I don't know why the shepherds got black ink. Maybe this guy didn't like shepherds. This scribe had a bad experience getting his vellum or something. I don't know. But um, really interesting manuscript. I wish I had a picture for you, but uh, sadly I couldn't find one online. Here's Codex 461. Just another example of a minuscule. It's 344 leaves. It's the smallest copy of all four Gospels. It's about six and a half inches by almost four inches. There actually is a smaller, what you might call a pocket Bible, but only one page of it has ever been found from Oxyrhynchus. So as far as like a more substantial manuscript, this is like the closest thing to a pocket Bible you get. It comes from the year A.D. 835. As scholars study the manuscripts, they see, oh wow, this manuscript reads, number one here reads just like number 118. And they try to establish, if possible, a genealogical relationship between manuscripts. So if you can figure out which, which manuscript was copied from, then you can see that this is related to that manuscript and it's within the same family. So family one here is uh, what was discovered by Kearsop Lake. He had this group of manuscript 118, 131, 209, and more recently, 1582 has been added to this. And they said, they all look like Theta. They all look like this codex that we already knew about. And then there's family 13, also called the Farrar group. And then there's another family, the family called uh, 1424. And these are minuscules that line up pretty nicely with Codex M. And there's a whole bunch that fit into that category. One of the things that we're going to come back to in a little while is the story of the adulterous woman in John chapter 8. This story in Family 13, which is a collection of, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11 manuscripts, all of them, this story occurs in Luke at 2138. So this story from John 8 appears in Luke 21, 38 in all of these manuscripts. So that gives you like a sense of like, why does it matter that there's a family of manuscripts? Well, it matters because if they all have something unusual about them, that gives us a sense of what's going on here. Moving on then, let's take a look at some lectionaries. These are scriptures arranged in the order that lectors would read them out publicly as part of worship. We read about this in the New Testament. It says in Luke 4, 16, and he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. So Jesus is going to be the lector. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And then he read from Isaiah 61. Another example of this we see is from 1 Timothy 4.13 where we read, Paul giving advice to Timothy, until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Reading was a specialized skill. Most people couldn't read. How were they going to know what's in the Scriptures? Well, you have public reading of Scripture. And in our church services, in, in my tradition, this has totally disappeared. 
because of literacy, because of other things that we emphasize in our Sunday services. Uh, but for a long time, this was a really, really key part of the worship service was just simply reading out loud the scriptures to the people so they know what they say. The lectionaries are these interesting manuscripts where they have sections of scripture lined up based on when they were to be read in church. And so some of them are majuscule, some of them are minuscule, capital or lowercase letters. Over time, these things were formalized in many churches and they appear in a, in a regular fashion, just like the Jewish people to this day have the parasha, which is the portion that they're supposed to read every Sabbath. So this certain groups of Christians had these lectionaries that had the reading for that Sunday in it. They are fascinating and they are, believe it or not, still in use in the Greek Orthodox Church. To this day, they still have the same lectionaries going back to as early as the 8th century that they follow in their services. So I wanted to show you a video of this. First we're going to have a priest reading from John chapter 4, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, and he's going to do it in English, and then there's going to be some liturgy they sing, and then another priest will read the same passage from the Greek, from the lectionary. He sings it just like the Hebrew is sung in the synagogue today, so the Greek is sung in the Greek Orthodox Church. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days, and more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of your words that we believe. We have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed Christ, the Savior of the world. <laughs> Thank you. Ο Ιησούς και κοπιακός εκ της οδηπορίας εκαθέζεται ούτως επί τη πηγή ώρα είναι ως η έκτη έρχεται γινή εκ της Σαμαρίας αντλήσε είδωρ λέγει αυτή ο Ιησούς δώσ μη πειν So that was from St. Nectarius Greek Orthodox Church This was just a regular Sunday service from May 2020 church in Massachusetts and uh, you know it was just something that could show you how this is done with lectionaries even to this day. What do you think? Did that seem pretty similar to you to the um, Jewish video we watched a little while ago where they're reading the Torah and uh, or does it seem different? You know Muslims also sing their scriptures in Arabic uh, so I don't know maybe there's something to singing your scriptures that uh, those of us who do not have that tradition could learn from it. Uh, on to now our category of the Church Fathers. An example from Eusebius, from his Ecclesiastical History book, Book 1, Chapter 4, Paragraph 5, and I kind of like skipped ahead a little bit, but it says, This was at the time of the first census, a registration mentioned also by Flavius Josephus, the most famous of the Hebrew historians who adds an account of the Galilean sect that arose at the same time to which our own Luke refers in Acts. And then he quotes Acts, Chapter 5. After him arose Judas the Galilean at the time of the census. He persuaded some of the people to follow him, but he too perished and all his followers were scattered. He's writing a book on the history of the church, basically from the time of the New Testament up until the 300s AD. So he quotes everybody all the time, but one of the sources he quotes a lot is the Bible, the New Testament. And so what we can do is we can compare his quotation to what manuscripts we have, or maybe we don't have that many manuscripts for a particular verse. We can look to Eusebius and many of, other, of the other church fathers to figure out what, in fact, is the evidence from that period. So here's a list of some of the early Christian authors that we get from 
Mesker and Ehrman's book, uh, there are actually a lot more than this, and these are really just a, a, a smattering of them. In the second century, we have Marcion, and Justin, and Tatian. I would also add to that the Didache. Uh, in the third century, Irenaeus, Clement, Tertullian, Origen, Cyprian. Fourth century, we have a lot there. The fifth century, even into the sixth century. So what scholars can do is they can work through these different church fathers. And a lot of this work has already been done and is actually available on computer software today. These church fathers, though, they're not as useful for figuring out what the New Testament is so much as useful for figuring out when a particular manuscript tradition was commonly accepted by Christianity. Because we know the date of these church fathers pretty well, at least certainly within half a century for almost all of them. Um, and a lot of times we have even more accurate information than that. So if we can find a particular manuscript reading in a church father, that'll give us some sense of when to date that too. Total Greek New Testament manuscripts. We've got 130 papyri, we've got 320 uncials, we've got 3,000 minuscules, and 2,500 lectionaries. I'm not even going to mention the quotations from the Church Fathers. Approximately 5,950, almost 6,000 Greek New Testament manuscripts. And then we have these tons of quotations from the Church Fathers. Uh, Metzger and Ehrman write, Indeed, so extensive are these citations in the various books that Christians wrote in the early years, that all, if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. The importance of patristic quotations lies in the circumstance that they serve to localize and date readings and types of text in the Greek manuscripts and versions. So even if there was some evil empire that arose and they went through all the museums, and of course these days you'd have to delete it from computers and from the internet and the cloud and everywhere else, uh, but say they succeeded in just wiping out the New Testament, all the manuscripts of the New Testament, and we wanted to reconstruct it, we could still do it just from the writings of the church fathers. And, you know, Christians, if you go to a Christian bookstore, it's full of books, right? Christians are writing tons of books today. Well, we've always been like that. <laughs> so if you go back to the second century, we have lots of books that survived from that period too. They're called the Apostolic Fathers, the second half of the first century, first half of the second century. Then we have the, the authors called the Apologists in the second half of the second century, the first half of the third century. We have these theologians in the third century, and it just gets more and more and more from there into the fourth century and following. So uh, we could actually reconstruct the entire New Testament just from how many times different Christians have quoted it over the years in its original language, in Greek. We're not talking about translations yet. Uh, now, the Society of Biblical Literature has a series of books that catalog this on a series called The New Testament in the Greek Fathers. And it seems like this is kind of fizzled out. Uh, don't mean to be nitpicky here, but it started in 1986, and uh, then it was followed up in 91, 92, and this is where they're basically extracting out of these different church fathers just the text of the New Testament that they had available to them. And it seems like up until about 2010, this was uh, cruising along, but uh, we haven't really seen anything since 2010. So hopefully they keep going with this, and this is helpful for New Testament scholars to figure things out. Uh, we also have ancient translations. And ancient translations are actually pretty important. They're not just like a throwaway category. Uh, they are significant in figuring out what the New Testament is in certain cases. Now, some of our unseals have Latin interlinears. And I wanted to show you a picture of this. Actually, I have two pictures. This is Codex Sangelensis from the 9th century. It's a copy of John chapter 1. Beautiful manuscript here, right? We've got these nice colors in it. It says at the top of the page, Evangelion kata Ioannin, uh, which translates the gospel according to John. And we can read in the very large print there, the word N, that's epsilon ni, or in English, I-N, just means N, and it's in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, right? In our he and o logos, ke o logos in prostontion. And then right above it, right above the Greek letters here, we have Latin. And so this is an early inter interlinear from, you know, centuries and centuries ago, the ninth century. And it says, in principio, erat verbum. 
So in the beginning was the word, and they have Latin mixed in with the Greek, which is pretty cool because as time went on, the empire switched from being more Greek-based, like in the time of Jesus, much more Greek-based, to being more Latin-focused. This is Codex Boernianus of 1 Corinthians, and you can see that, once again, we have the double writing here. The larger letters, once again, are in Greek, and then the smaller letters are in Latin. So we can see the large... Uh, print here, it says, Pros Romeos et Telesti, which means uh, to the Romans. And then it, it, it's the word ended, right? It, it's the, ended of that, the ending of that book. And then you have Pros Corinthius Archete, which means the beginning of to the Corinthians. And uh, then above it, it says, Ad Romanos Explicit. And then above the Corinthians part, Ad Corinthios Incipit. So uh, we see that, once again, this is an interlinear for these versions. And so what I want to talk to you about in this category is a number of these different ancient languages that you're probably all not, not all that familiar with, uh, but their manuscripts survive, and they really do help us to see how we can trace back certain readings to earlier times, and in particular, locations, because a lot of times languages flourish in a particular location, and that really helps. So first up, we have the Syriac. Uh, Syriac with uh, the superscript S refers to a uh, manuscript that was found by the same twins, these uh, Scottish ladies that found the Cairo Geniza and brought Solomon Schechter to it. They also were the ones who found this uh, Syriac New Testament. S-Y-R, and then superscript P is the Peshitta. We have about 350 manuscripts of them. And then S-Y-R, or Syriac, superscript P-A-L, is the, the Palestinian Syriac. Then we have the Old Latin. We've got about 38 copies of Old Latin, according to D.C. Parker. And these are abbreviated with the letters I-T. It'll be I-T, and then it'll be a superscript. Like A, for example, refers to Versilensis which is probably the oldest European manuscript, 4th century of the Old Latin. Uh, and then we have uh, one of the most interesting Bibles, Codex Gigas, which is a Latin Bible of gigantic proportions. It is 40 inches by 36 inches when it's laid open, and it took allegedly 160 donkeys to make enough parchment for this Bible. It's 8.7 in inches thick. I mean, our standard paper is eight and a half inches, right? Eight and a half by 11. So that's how wide a piece of paper is. This is thicker than the width of a standard piece of paper. And it weighed 160 pounds. Hello. This is a serious Bible. It's an old Latin Bible coming to us from the 13th century. And it's not just a complete Bible either, uh, but it also has books of history by Josephus. It had etymologies by Isidore of Seville. It has a chronicle by Cosmos of Prague. It has medical works by Constantine the African. It has maybe even had the rules of the Benedictine monks now lost. It's basically a book that summarized all of the best knowledge of the 13th century and is known today sometimes as the Devil's Bible because of the drawing, the very large drawing of the devil. And there's a myth that goes along with it, that there was a, a monk in a monastery and he was being, he was doing something he wasn't supposed to do and he got caught and he was going to be in a lot of trouble. And so he told his superior, well, let me, let me make a manuscript, let me, let me copy a manuscript that will make our monastery famous. And I will do it all in one night. And so uh, he allegedly was working on it and doing this fine calligraphy that we can uh, see just impeccable workmanship here. And uh, he knew he wasn't going to get through the whole Bible. And uh, so he allegedly made a deal with the devil. He said, I'll sell my soul to the devil if he helps me finish this manuscript in one night. And uh, allegedly he did, and that's how we got this manuscript. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody really believes this, but it's a little mythology that gets tied in with this particular uh, Bible. Scholars uh, f have looked at this, National Geographic did a special on it, and they estimate that it would take, not including the drawings or the embellishments, 
that are on the sides and, and everything. Just the calligraphy alone would take one scribe 20 years of continuous effort to complete. Uh, so this is really a masterpiece of medieval manuscripts. And it's an old Latin, uh, not to be confused with the Vulgate. The Vulgate is actually a different category. The Latin Vulgate we have about 157 copies of, uh, according to D.C. Parker. And we have uh, a number of important ones from the 7th century. For example, Codex Amiatinus, uh, which is abbreviated with just a V-U-L for Vulgate and then superscript A is Amiatinus, and that one weighs 75 pounds. Can you imagine a book weighing 75 pounds? Then you also have Rho, that's actually a capital Rho, not a P, and that's the Golden Gospels, possibly the finest of the purple manuscripts written in gold ink, uh, which they call a sumptuous codex in the 10th century. Then you have the Coptic manuscripts. Coptic is the latest form of the Egyptian language where it's basically written with Greek letters. They import a couple of extra letters into it, but it looks like Greek, but if you actually can read Greek, you won't be able to read Coptic. It's a totally different language. And it has five different dialects, the Sahidic, the Bahoric, the Achimic, the Memphitic, and the Fayumic. The biblical manuscripts are found in all five of those dialects of Coptic, this Egyptian language. Uh, but by the 11th century, Sahidic and the Bahoric were the only two that persisted. And to this day, Baharic is actually the language that Coptic Christians use for their religious services in the Coptic Church. This is a sect of Christianity that split off from Western Christianity in the year 451 uh, because they disagreed over the dual natures of Christ. Um, but they, they're still here. You know, they didn't go anywhere. And so uh, they were the ones that stewarded and really thrived using these manuscripts in the ancient times. But since the Coptic manuscripts, some of them are so old, they're actually really helpful for figuring out uh, some stuff with the New Testament original Greek. Arminian uh, Christianity came to Armenia in the third century. King Tiridates III converted and made Armenia a Christian kingdom. This is even before the Roman Empire. Uh, moving on then, we have the Gothic manuscripts, uh, abbreviated G-O-T. A missionary named Ophelus, the apostle to the Goths, translated the Bible into Gothic. And Ophelus actually made also his own Gothic alphabet so that he could get the Bible into their language. Then we have Georgian, not to be confused with the uh, state just north of Florida in the United States, but it's actually the country over by Russia, uh, Georgian. And uh, this is, we have a couple of manuscripts there, one from the 9th century, one from the 10th century, and uh, they are used in comparing different uh, manuscripts of the Greek. Then you have Ethiopic. Christianity came to Ethiopia super early, and uh, Christianity flourished there. It was actually one of the earliest Christian kingdoms. Again, you had a real connection between Ethiopic Christianity and Egyptian Christianity, and a lot of uh, transferring between the two of them. But we have some manuscripts of Ethiopic from the 13th and the 15th century that are certainly used, and we're actually going to refer to those when we look at the ending on the Gospel of Mark later on. Then you have Old Slavonic, which comes to us from the 11th century. Missionaries, Cyril and Methodius, known as the Apostles to the Slavs, uh, they created the Glagolitic alphabet, and in the 9th century they translated the Gospels into... Old Slavonic, also called Old Bulgarian. And then we have a whole bunch of other languages, ancient languages. We have Arabic, Old Nubian, Sogdian, which is a language from Iran, and Anglo-Saxon as well. So before closing out, I just want to mention two important organizations that do a lot of work on manuscripts. One is the Universität Münster Institut für New Testamentliche Textforschung which translates to the Institute for New Testament Textual Research, which is in Munster, Germany. It was founded in 1959 by Kurt Aland. He founded a Bible museum there in 1979, where he was donated a number of manuscripts, and he's collected a number of these manuscripts over the years, and others have, after he died, that took over. And uh, so basically what happened in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, Aland and others, traveled the world. It was like a whole new age of Tischendorf. And they had this new invention that did this incredible thing called a camera to take 
photographs. <laughs> and now we're not depending on transcribing things. And so what uh, the INTF did is they traveled all over the world and they took all these photographs. And in, in that era, in the late 20th century, the best way for dealing with this sort of information was on microfilm because you could store lots of, at, their, at that time, what would be considered high quality uh, photographs in a small space. And uh, this institute has collected, uh, as of 2017, 5,800 Greek New Testament manuscripts. And that's not to say that they have the originals, it's that they have the photographs or they have uh, transcriptions of them. And the other one I wanted to mention that's doing a lot of work with New Testament manuscripts is the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, which was founded by Daniel Wallace in 2002 in Plano, Texas. Wallace and his researchers have once again traveled the world, gone to all these museums, gone to the monasteries, and what they have available is super high quality digital photograph equipment that involves using different kinds of light as well. So sometimes if you put a certain color light on a manuscript, it'll make it more visible. So they photograph manuscripts in different light and then they make it available on their website for free to everyone, so long as the museum doesn't say no. So there are some very famous manuscripts where the museum says, no, you can't put that on your website, but they still have it at their research institute, but you can't look at it unless you go to that museum. So uh, there are a few like that, but a lot of it is available. So our total number of sources for the New Testament is actually somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000. I mean, it's just a staggering number of evidence for the New Testament that scholars will then have to work through to figure it out. Here's a comparison of a lot of other ancient Greek literature. So we have for example, Homer up here, it was written about 850 BC. There are 643 copies extant or that survive today. Herodotus, we've got eight copies. Thucydides, we have eight copies. Aristotle, we have five copies. Demosthenes, we have 200 copies. That's pretty good. But then we get to the New Testament. It's just like, what? 5,900 manuscripts? I mean, it's just like so bizarre that there would be this many unless... God was himself behind it, preserving the text, helping people to figure it out that this text really did something in people's lives that they were like, man, I need, to, I need to make more copies of this. The span for most of these works is about over a thousand years between when they were written and when the oldest copy is that we have today. The span for the entire New Testament is only 250 years. And that would be between the time that the last part of the New Testament was written, about 100 AD, and when the first complete New Testament was found, and that's Codex Sinaiticus, which would be about the year 350. So it's a 250 year span, but it's actually better than that because we have P52, which is the earliest fragment of the New Testament, which was written within 30, 40 years. In one sense, we are in such incredible shape that it's just like, it, it looks like a miracle. I mean, even if you're not a believer, I mean, I am a believer, but even if you're not a believer, you can't help but say the preservation of the New Testament has been miraculous. I mean, it's just a matter of numbers. However, the more manuscripts you have, the more work it takes to compare them to each other to arrive at the original reading or the final form of the text that we have access to today that was passed down. And so we are going to turn to that question of how we do that work in our next lecture as we do our best to continue our quest to learn how we got our Bibles. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening through to the end. I just want to let you know that in the show notes for this episode, I've got some books that might be helpful for you if you want to do further research, as well as links to three main websites. One is SBL's publications of the New Testament in the Greek Fathers. That's uh, quotations in the early church fathers. The second is the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, which has really cool high-resolution pictures of many different New Testament manuscripts. And then the third is the Institute for New Testament Textual Research, and you can take a look at the work that they're doing employing computer software to start tracing back differences between manuscripts to arrive at the best text possible. And we're going to be getting much more into that next time. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to support us, visit restitutio.org where you can do that. We'll see you next time. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.